Baruchim Abayim, and welcome to Torah Talks Chazak's Tuesday night program with special guest tonight. We have with us Dr. Shlaimi Zuring. How you doing? Baruch Hashem. Ah. Great to see you, Rabbi. Great. All the way from Queens. That's right. <laughs> Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. We have the Schut the Merit of having over here all over the world rabbis and guest speakers and, and educators and influencers and people that make a difference in Kalati Shah. And Baruch Hashem, today we have our dear friend. And uh, we're going to be talking about a topic that unfortunately is uh, not comfortable, but the, the topic of struggles. And many people are going through different struggles. Before we get to tonight's topic, if we could uh, get a little bit of background about yourself. Okay, so I originally came from Brooklyn. Really? I went to Tarvid <laughs> Elementary School. <laughs> okay. Then uh, Chavetz Chaim, Brooklyn High School. And then the base Madrash Chavetz Chaim, first one was in Forest Hills, now in Hugo Arm Hills. Uh, been a long way from there, I'm going to graduate school in psychology, uh, working you know, private practice as well as the community a lot. And uh, I've had the privilege to really work closely with a lot of the Gedolim, especially Aurelia Brudney and Ravon Feldman, uh, who's wrote a forward to my book, you know, many different Gedolim. So, Baruch Hashem, it's a big source to be able to work very closely with Hassan Fem Rabbanon and Gedolim. And uh, I get to work with Rabbi Yanin. Baruch Hashem, this is also ours, Baruch Hashem, we have the merit of... Uh, all the gedolim that you mentioned to have a relationship with them and to be in touch with them and the questions that we get over here all the time is uh, very very interesting and uh, we're in touch with them on a daily basis and uh we're going to be talking about, like i mentioned about struggles and uh in the previous generation they had certain struggles but today the struggles are completely different if you could touch upon that of uh the difference of uh yesteryear and today so I'm definitely not a historian, so oh, no. I, I don't <laughs> I don't know that much about the history. And, and people like to say everything is different, but the human condition has been struggling since Adam and Chava. That's right. day one. Day one. So struggle is part and parcel of the human DNA and the Jewish DNA. Now, what people sus- suspect happened, and there's some data to back this up, that the previous generation was rebuilding, whether it would be post-Holocaust for the Ashkenazim, as far as the most, many expulsions and tyranny that they lived through, that a lot of the, second, the generation that came from there had to rebuild. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps. We're not going to sit here and talk about feelings the whole day. We have to, mouths to feed. We have businesses to build. We have professions to get into. So there, there was a tremendous emphasis on pushing through and discipline. Right. That seemingly reached a point where almost there was too much discipline. There was a, a forcefulness bashing of self-esteem, a lot of perfectionism, and a lot of people started to struggle. So the rebuilding period, we were unbelievably matzliah. There's been no nation history that ever went through what we went through in the last hundred years and has rebuilt what we have built. It is so fast and so strong and bigger and better. It is absolutely miraculous with Hashem's help. Me continues. Me is a hundred. Some of the price that we paid along the way was that things got a little too far. And now this generation is almost the opposite. Everything is about feelings. Feelings, feelings, feelings. I, 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 right? The past generation also very not ego-based. It wasn't about me. It was a survival of Christ, so survival of the family. Today, everything is I. So we have a certain lack of structure, discipline, and we have a tremendous focus on the self, which was helpful to some people who were coming back from too intense discipline, too much structure, but now we're seeing them really struggle. We're... Today, we almost have what we call victim culture, things like that, where everybody is struggling and very hard to get people to take responsibility, very hard to get the youth, especially to be really inspired for something meaningful, to feel attached to things. And they're bombarded by messages that is historically unprecedented from the world, from the media, from everything that is in their pockets, it's all isolated, everything with all the messages mm-hmm. that are antithetical to you know, healthy living, let alone Torah values. And we're at the forefront of trying to address that. So those are some of the broad spectrum issues. Unbelievable. So the, one of the major issues uh, we deal with a lot we are, so the is that we uh, have a lot of teenagers that, that we help, uh, especially in the public school systems. And one thing that we realize, and it's not really only with them, uh, it's really a lot of people, is that they're really addicted on the phones. Like we would give a class and you know what we would do? We would have this uh, exciting you know, uh, thing that we have all the students take their phones and put them aside. And... Uh, there's an issue, you know, families tell me about how dinner time is not dinner time because everyone is on the phones, et cetera, for Shabbos and stuff. If you could touch upon the point and what can be done about it. So I think it's very easy for people to get into a room and just bash 
smartphones and people on their phone the whole day, it's so easy. It's a throwaway. And then what does everybody do? They forward that message on WhatsApp and back on their phone. The whole thing is really like, it, it's like a, almost a sad joke on some level. So I think when we look at what's the allure of the phone, what's, what's it bringing to us? Firstly, I think this you know, is a Torah talk. So I think we can connect this to the idea who created the internet and smartphones. All right, this is all HaKadosh Baruch Hu's plan for us to deal with the Eight Sahara in a new fashion. There's Ein Kol Chodesh Tachas Shamas. This is not a new phenomenon in terms of the, the foundation of being distracted and being pulled away and not following the value the system that you want. But the manner in which it plays out is today different. But when we look at what is happening for most people is that sitting, talking to somebody face to face has become almost uncomfortable for them. Yeah. It's a lot easier. I'm just going to send a text, a DM, a WhatsApp, something. I don't have to deal with the interface. It's like the husband and wife on a date and uh, husband speeds and she texts him plus, you know. <laughs> exactly. Because it creates a certain distance. It creates a protection. It's also constant distraction, which gives me also constant little hits of dopamine. Every few seconds, I get a little ding that I'm excited, something new. Whereas today's generation, to sit with something that's maybe old and I know and I've seen it before, um, that's more difficult. And almost everybody, including all the adults who are bemoaning these facts are, like you said, it's husbands and wives too. So it's not like the kids today are really struggling differently, right? Like you said, you go to a restaurant and yeah, yeah. everybody is struggling. So I think we have to set a le uh, an example as adults, let alone as leaders, let alone as our bonum, in terms of how can we put away our phones. Also to try to enhance the family time, to make it more engaging, to make it more exciting, to make it more real and authentic. So a lot of families, you go around, okay, how's your day? Fine, fine, fine. And you know, <laughs> that five seconds later, there's nothing to do. How can we draw out? How can we ask real authentic questions? Are you really ready to hear when your children think, no, I had a terrible day at school and you're not going to fly off the handle. Or your wife says to you, oh, you know what the kids were like today, All right? Are we ready to really listen? Mm -hmm. And what's happening with the phone is we're not ready to listen because I have distractions over there. I have to listen to this. And so we're losing real engagement, real friendships, real interactions for the fake. But the fake is powerful because there I don't have any stress. I don't have to deal with anything over there. I could just ping it away, swipe away. So we have to help people cope better with the stressors. We have to practice. So in my family, we do a very simple thing. We go around the table. Everyone has to say what was bad, medium, and good from their day. So first of all, you can't just say, oh, okay, because yeah. <laughs> in the three categories. And it also gets, sends a message. I don't need just to hear, oh, you've got a check from Rebbe today and we learned great. Like, I really want to hear something that was it's difficult. Daily routine. We try to drop daily. Listen, you know, <laughs> I'd be lying. I'd struggle like the rest. I struggle <laughs> to put down my phone. I struggle to keep the family at dinner all together. But Check. when I'm mindful of it, this is something that we do. And once it becomes habitual, it's actually easier because instead of like, oh, I have to have a stupid conversation, it's what we do. And what's interesting is after a little bit of time, the kids actually got into it because each of them gets a share and they have a turn. Now, some of the kids likes to squirm away and it's like, no, I need to hear something bad or good and read him. And so what happens is the kid who loves to share good, he actually struggles with the bad. The kid who for, has a more negative mindset, he's I have nothing good to me. Mm -hmm. Substitute was terrible and the teacher was terrible and recess, I lost the game. <laughs> and we have to focus in. Let's do something medium and then something good. And we're actually, so retraining ourselves to look for. Yeah, throughout the day, they're looking, that's an amazing So, so just a, a simple thing, but it requires that the adults at least first put their phones away and are there present all together. And that's sometimes a Herculean task. This kid coming home from Yeshia this time, at that time. So everyone loves to give out these ideal messages. Okay, yes, we're all going to sit around dinner with no phones and everyone's going to lovingly, gazingly hear about each other's day. Be realistic about your family. Maybe this can happen once a week, maybe twice a week. If it's happening once a month, try to make it every two weeks. Every gradual improvement right. is what's crucial. We go off and get these messages, especially these quick uh, talks or podcasts. They say quick inspiration, yeah, cool. and then five minutes later, I'm back to my regular life. Take a moment and pause. What is actually productive for your family? And, and what's realistic? And realistic yeah, in your family. If you have two different kids that come home at three different hours, and your husband comes home two hours later, and he's lucky if he sees anybody, then this is not for you. Yeah. And then figure out a different way. How do we schedule a different time where we're bonding, we're together, where we have something, a family unity? So you have to customize advice. That's a big thing in general that we give out these you know, blank screen advice for everybody, these catch-all phrases, little sound bites. And really, each person has to know their own selves, their own family, their own struggle, and custom tailor it. Amazing. 
So, so Dr. Zubin, you are a birth from a from the psychologist, then you see a lot of people, I'm sure. What is one of the struggles that stick out uh, that uh, you see is recurring and what can be done about it? So like I alluded to before, you know, we, we, we see a certain weakness internally that people don't feel comfortable in, their, in themselves. You know, to talk about it Torah-wise, Revolba described already in 1982, he wrote That's this an amazing true. article called Psychiatry Vidas. It was actually very brief history. San Glaniado Hospital was actually founded by this Claude de Rebbe. Yeah. So the met all the eleven kids in the wife. And he picked himself up and he said, and that was actually he got shot and he was taken care of by somebody. He said, This is what I see what medical care could do. I'm gonna found a hospital. Wow. So this hospital had a bizarre medical journal where the Gedolim wrote Hadrofa and Hashkafa. <laughs> So Revolba has like a 40-page article there. And there he outlines many things. He's giving messages to mental health professionals, psychiatrists, therapists, everybody. And he describes that, first of all, just as a, a, to frame the whole thing, he says, if you wanted to touch up all of Torah in one word, if you wanted to define Torah, he says, what's one word? He says, yididos, which really means friendship, closeness, camaraderie, connection. Oh. So we're just talking about the disconnect of today. All right, and he says, what's the opposite? What's the avodazar? is avoda zara what's the word zara estrangement mm -hmm. he says azul kel zar shabada who's the strange god in the person that's the koach of zaras to be a stranger and he says if he wanted to define a torah psychology he would put it on two poles the positive is yididus closeness friendship relatedness exactly. and the opposite is zaras and then he describes how you could be attached yididus to yourself to others and to hashem and the opposite you could be distance from yourself, others, and Hashem. So what we're seeing today is unbelievable thing where people are really, they're disconnected from Yiddishkeit and Hashem in a real healthy relationship way. They don't feel a Yedidus. Hashem calls himself Yedid, calls himself our friend, Rey, our friend, right? We have no sense of that. Then it goes to families are fractured, communities are fractured, and ultimately the person themselves feels, who am I and what's going on for me? And so he, we see this tremendously today where people talk about these friends and talk about these connections, but they're so broken and they're so unauthentic. And really when it gets bad to the bedrock in the person themselves, they don't know how to deal. We talked about the title of today's struggle with the struggles within them. How do I have this beautiful light, positivity, energy, hope for connection and meaning and purpose and dark forces inside of me. And sometimes I just feel crazy. Like, who is this guy? One second he's like this, one second he's like that. And we, we haven't done a good enough message explaining that is what it means to be human. That is the whole essential struggle of the human. And today it manifests in outside distractions as well. But fundamentally, this has always been Yedidus versus Zaris. How connected are you going to be? How estranged are you going to be? And the work of today is trying to really get people back connected to themselves. Many things have happened to them. A lot of dif difficulties emotionally, a lot of traumas, a lot of tragedy. People don't fit into a system. Again, in some ways, we're a victim of success. When we had to just live to survive, to put food on the table, you didn't have time to think about, how do I feel about things? My grandfather, if I would ask him, how do you feel about something? He looked at me funny. Like, what did that have to do with anything? Like, here's what I have to do, right? Today, we have a lot of time and energy to spend on that, but there's a, a, a big cost attached to that. So we have to get people to be able to connect to that the struggle is normal. The struggle is human. The struggle is what makes us Jews, especially, you know, to me, in terms of a Torah talk, you know, there, there are two names we call Jews by. One is Yisraelim and one is Yehuda. So if you think about, let's take Yisraelim first, right? When does a Pasuk come can tell us, right? <clears throat> You're not going to be called Yaakov anymore. You're going to be called Yisrael. Why? Kisarisa in Elohim va'anoshim va'tucha. That you battled with and struggled with spiritual forces, gods, kilu and humans, and you prevailed. Tucha, you won. So if you and I were sitting down to then name the Jews based on that Pasuk, what would be the name we gave them? Struggles. That's the... No, that, I would say, B'nai Tucha, oh. we should be called, we win. Oh, yeah. We, we Why focus on the struggles, focus on the success? We won the battle. Yaakov Avina wins. We should be called B'nai Tucha. <laughs> the, those who vanquish the enemy succeed. So both the Balak Hasidus and the Balak Musr tell us no, because the name is, talks about the essence. And the essence of a Jew is the Sarisa. Hashem doesn't care about the results. That's what Hashem's help. 
our job is the struggle. And we have to help kids see that the struggle isn't a bad thing. The spite you have internally, the confusion you have, the confusion you have between do I turn to the Gemara, do I turn to my smartphone? Do I turn to my wife? Do I turn to my smartphone? It doesn't matter how it manifests. That's a human struggle that Hashem is putting it's in front normal. of you. It's perfectly normal. It's healthy. It's what Hashem designed. But you can dig deeper. And if you keep battling, eventually you can prevail. Similarly, Yehudim is in some ways also fascinating. Yehudim got the name. appreciation. But really, Chazal then bring down that it was because Hoyda Veloy Bush in the, you know, Misa with Tamar. So he had a whole incident where he didn't realize it was his daughter-in-law. He thought she was an inappropriate relationship that he was having. And they were about to burn his daughter-in-law at the stake. And he was like, oh gosh, Tzadka, yeah, yeah. Mimani, she's the right one. Mimani, both, it, it was my fault. And Mimani, it's, it's of mine, this whole, that, that's all the signs that she was holding, they're mine. So what we describe is, again, instead of picking one of these glorious moments of Kala Yisrael, where, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu gets the Torah or something, you know, call us something like that. We pick this lowly, complicated event. And we say, Yehudim, because he wasn't embarrassed to admit. So we have both the Hodaya. Every, if you have that, everything is coming from Hashem. If you realize, Hapama this was beyond what she thought even there, she was supposed to have. She had a fourth son. It was above and beyond. You realize, no, everything is from Hashem. Then you can ultimately admit to everything. You realize, wow, I'm humble. I'm a human. I'm frail. I goofed up royally. But I can overcome. And that ability to appreciate Hashem and to admit is what really powers us forward. It was fascinating. Um, Rabbi Dr. Abraham J. Tursky, all of us shalom. So he was like, you know, the man in the mental health field. But actually, he wasn't such a big fan of individual therapy. So he was more into 12 steps and things like that. So I'm a guy who's comfortable asking difficult questions. My mentor and him were very, very close friends. So the first time I ever met him at an Efesh conference, I went over to him, Rabbi Torsky, Shalom Aleichem, thank you so much. But, you know, here you are at a mental health conference. Most of the people here are doing one-on-one -on -one therapy and you're not such a fan. You're like, so what's the whole thing? So he told me a fascinating word, totally random, I thought at first. He says to me, you say Ashray all the time, right? Yeah. It has all the letters of the al Aleph Bays, right? Yeah. So which one's missing? scrambling it says nun why is there no nun because it's neufel nun is for falling for not succeeding for failing that falling down and you're stuck he says you can't have nun neufel but he says look at the next one what is it samach what is it soymech hashem lechol han neuflin when you can have a soymech hashem when you realize hashem's there for you even when you messed up even in your struggle even in your down hashem's there then you can have nasila he said whatever you do to help a human being realize Saimech Hashem, to build up his internal sense that he's there and Hashem's with him, then you're going to help him no matter what because then he can handle all his struggles and all his nefilas. So when we give over messages, we like to sometimes cleanse. We make all the holy rabbis and rabbitsons and everybody doesn't have struggle and they're pure and everything is you know clean. Then we don't relate to our kids and they don't have much to walk away with. I think we have to impart messages of constant struggle because every person is going to struggle, whether you went through some, you know, horrible trauma or just living. I don't know anybody who doesn't struggle. Sure. All right. So, you know, we typically, if you're not struggling, you're in the box, you know, they, <laughs> they bury you. Um, so we're going to struggle and our children and our family. We need more and more messages about how normal struggle is, how we handle struggle and how we overcome. And then I think we can be a much healthier, connected people. So the message that we're trying to get out there is that struggles are normal. It's okay. It's fine. It's much more than that. This is not a bit of it. Oh, it's okay. A lot of times we say, okay, what should I do? I struggle. No, Hashem has malachim upstairs that don't struggle. He has them by the billions. Paying for pain. The struggle is the purpose. Ah. So it's not just, oh, it's okay. You poor thing, you struggle. No, mm -hmm. if Hashem didn't want us to be struggling with smartphones, there would be no smartphones. We, we see uh, the whole thing with a, with a little side. We say, uh, struggle is normal. No, no, no. Struggle is why you're here. It's the reason. The reason you're here. And so it's not just that. It's, there's going to be a part of you that always is looking for that estrangement, that Zorus, that to detach from myself. Right? When we get, like Revolva says, when you get super angry and you have a temper tension and you act out on your, your coworker or your spouse or your child, what do you say afterwards? I wasn't myself. Mm -hmm. Who were you? 
<laughs> what happened? Take what happened? You have a sense that no, like that lower part of me that not that's not the real true me. That's not the part exactly. That's not going to be there when in the Olam Ames in the truth place in the eternal place, right? I have a sense that wasn't me. That was beneath me, right? But that's how we feel. And the Atar's job is to make you constantly feel like that. Yeah, you're you're out of control. You're taken over. Every turn we do, most of it's quiet internal. When I don't look at that inappropriate thing, when I don't criticize my wife or my children, when I choose to use my time more wisely, when I take responsibility instead of shying away and, you know, blaming all of these things, we think spiritual, these, ooh, ah, just when you have a Gemara in front of you or a Siddur, every single moment when I am more godly, when I am more honest, kind, compassionate, concerned, truthful, those are the godly moments, and that's why we're here. So it's not like, oh, it's okay, it's normal. That's the whole reason you're here. And that's when you turn that struggle into something positive. That's, you're perfecting the world and everybody around you. Now, it's very subtle. We wait for these big home runs. I'm going to impact thousands and millions, and my family's going to look great. No, it's every single moment. It's in the day-to-day -day grind. It's that your kid's annoying you, and you turn your frown into a smile. You turn to them. Those are the moments. And the more we can appreciate that, and again, each person in their own life, they have to know what their struggle is. What her, her struggle is and what his struggle is have nothing to do with each other. His struggle might be to learn another hour a day. That person's struggle might be to get out of the base medish and go home to the wife and kids. I, every person has to know their own, but they have to know that Hashem is giving it to them and He's there with them. And like we said, when there's an afilo or a struggle or even Yehuda, the Svas M is going back to that Yehuda. Yeah. If you spell it, Yehuda is, has Hashem's the Shema Mephorosh, Yud, K, Vav, K, in his name, and a Dalit. What's the Dalit? Dal is Dal, poor. Even Yehuda, in that moment, his lowest moment, here he is, the whole world is going to know that he did this thing that seemingly on the surface was highly, highly inappropriate. That's what Hashem's message is. My name is built with the Dalit in you. In every Jew, in your lowest moments, in your darkest times, in your biggest struggles, Hashem's there with you. And that's, again, why you could admit and own up and take responsibility because I'm a human being. If I was supposed to be an angel, everything's supposed to be perfect, I can't manage this. But if I know, okay, move, put it behind you, rectify it, move forward, and Hashem's with me in every step, then the sky's the limit. It's powerful. There's a beautiful uh, quote. I'm not sure where it comes from. I think you heard from Arabi, I'm logging the thought. Small actions make great people. Just like you were saying, if it's small struggles and you and you you know from the frown to the smile, it adds up and builds a person to what he is. And also Shavuot is coming up, <clears throat> the time we sing the Torah, the Torah actually ends. Beatah talking about Moshe's great hand, the Ain't Call Israel. So what they're referring to, the Mefarshim explained, and it's referring to him breaking the little clothes. So the question is why end the Torah in such a negative note? Right. It's coming to tell us that you, that that difficulties are part of life. And Yisrael is the last word. And every single one of our others, our forefather and foremother's names are in the word Yisrael. You have Avram, Yitzchik, Yaakov, Sarif, Karachale. And every single one of them, we pay close attention. Like the doctor is saying, they went through struggles. They went through difficulties. They went through hardships. But they persevered. 100%. They went through it. So a person that's struggling, a person that's going through difficulties, and he feels like that struggle, that difficulty is over, I don't know what the right word is, but it's too much for him. Mm -hmm. What do we tell such an individual? So firstly, we have to tell them, going back to that message of Zarus, the Yitzhahara wants you to think that it's too much. It's, it's too much. It's impossible. You can't. Right? He loves to say, that guy struggled. That's a healthy struggle. I have a sick struggle. Right? If the rabbi knew what I'm struggling with, he wouldn't even talk to me. That's what we call in psychology, we're shame. Really unhealthy, toxic shame is this feeling that if anybody really knew the real me, they would want nothing to do with me. And it's one of the most devastating emotions imaginable because it keeps you out of real connection. I can't really show up here and tell you who I really am because you're going to run the other way. And so I put on a front and then I say, oh, Rabbi Yana is so nice to me, but because he only sees the fake me. So that breaks apart connection. So one of the most important things is to realize every struggle has been in there. We just read, again, I don't know when this will air, but this past week we read Akhe Kedoshim, which we then read on Yom Kippur, is all the arayos, yes. all the struggles, Yom Kippur, Afternoon okay. before Nihila, Come you're on. gonna read all this. And who's it talking about? Oh, the sick stuff? No, no, no. That's the most integral part of the human condition. Every single person struggles and youth and the Yitzhar wants you to think. Mm -hmm. 
Like that's what Acher's struggle was, that he made you an Acher. And that's why in the, in the more Kabbalistic version, they call it Sitra Acher. It puts you on the other side. It tells you, no, no, that's the normal struggle. You're on the abnormal struggle. Now, of course, there are, what I spend my day with is with clinically significant struggle. If there's somebody who gets a little nervous or a little sad is very different than somebody who has an anxiety disorder or depression, right? There are people who get bumps or, you know, in life. And then there are people who have serious traumas and it horribly affects them. So I'm not saying that there's the isn't a level to which that needs a lot of help, not outside, you know, outside of yourself. So first of all, to know that, again, you're on one hand, that's the, it's the hardest job is to convince you it's something really wrong with you. And the other part is it's true. Nobody, we say, that when we speak about the Yitzhar, that if Hashem does not help us, we could not overcome it. The struggle is too great. We need a partner. So the difference in, you know, the struggle of today's generation is everyone's thinking, I need to do it, right? I have to have my self-esteem that I can vanquish everything and, you know, conquer struggle and just discipline myself. That's not really a Jewish concept. Yes, we need betach and atzmi, like our tzaddik said, you have to have a belief in yourself. Why? Because Hashem believes in you. Mm. But the ultimate thing is that I can do it because I'm plugged in to an infinite energy source. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to just get past the struggle. I might deal with depression for years. I might have a very big problem with my child. I might have a very difficult relationship with my spouse, with my parents, with my coworker. It doesn't mean there's not going to be difficulty. We like to paint this, you know, when you straighten yourself out, everything's going to be great. No, the whole world is here for struggle. There's a lot of darkness. The job is where can I put any little bit of light there? And also, for many people, a big part of struggle is when do I have to be able to hide the Veloid Bosch to admit I need help. Mm. I need to seek help. I need professional. I need to talk to a rabbi. I need to talk to a therapist. I need rehab. I need, I need marriage counseling. I need help with my child. That a, a lot of times we think I have to do it all alone. No. Hashem teaches us. The Torah teaches us. Nobody can do anything alone. The whole is. So we have to be there for each other. We have to be hooked in and realize a big part of being actually courageous and healthy is to realize I need help. Well, not I, I can't do this myself, and that's the beauty. You know, I love what we call it chazak. You know, we we need <laughs> we need to be chazak others and each other. We all need it. And that's the beautiful. That is funny, me Zimmer, and I see the chiz of the inspiration, and I agree with you a million percent. People have to remember also sheva pami There are failures. There are times that you don't uh, you know you fall down, but the key is to get back up. To 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 a hundred percent. And again, each person thinks the Yitzhar wants to say, no, that's what they tell the guy who was supposed to learn another Masechda and he only didn't do it all the way. Rebchan Kanievsky, he's a Sheva Yipot Tzadik. No, Sheva, seven in Judaism is a number for everything regular. Right. Seven days of the week, the seven cycles, right? So seven means just that's the normal way of the world. And then you overcome that, you something extraordinary. And that's exactly the concept that Hashem helps take you above. But part and parcel of the world, actually Rev Hutner in, in his beautiful famous letter about going up and down, says most people think I'm most similar to the Gedolim or to the great Rebetzins when I'm not struggling. Like you're like the Havis family, you don't speak any Lashon Hara. When I know my eyes are pure, I haven't looked at anything. He says, no, you're much more close to the Gedolim when you're struggling. <laughs> because that's what a real Gedolim is, isn't somebody who didn't struggle. It's somebody who's constantly battling with struggle. Now you don't see what his or her struggle might be. That's again the job of the it's a hard, you know, keep you the thinking that yours is a different or a terrible quality. If you have it, who gave it to you? If you're struggling with it today, even if you say, No, I may have messed up my life five years ago, I made these horrible decisions, I did these horrible things, but Hashem woke you up today with a mission. So for some people, and this is very hard, again, it's not this idealistic thing. For some people, I deal with people like this every day. Choosing not to kill themselves is Avodas Hashem, is their struggle. For other people, it's showing up. It's battling an addiction. It's battling a trauma. It's getting, it's out, of getting out of bed. It's, you know, having this phobia and, and you push through, right? It's being there for your kid. It's, you know what? And to the mundane. It's when your kid says something nasty about the supper, not losing it, right? It's putting that phone away, right? It doesn't have to be dramatic in every which way, but we have to know that there are people whose struggles have no connection to ours. And a lot of times we can't judge other people's struggles because you have no idea what the depths of their struggle could be like, but that every person has some place where there's some place for them to turn. That might be, help me, I'm, I'm lost. That might be a turning to Hashem and say, I can't do this myself. All of that is an integral part of growing and healing. Amazing. Amazing. 
So uh, before we do our final message, which is a custom uh, hack that we have in the Torah Talks, uh, we have your amazing book right over here in front of us, From Boys to Men, which has uh, become very, very, very popular. It's the doctor who just touch a little bit upon uh, this new release and uh, how it came about. And uh, I saw all the haskamot, all the affirmations of all the gadolim, like you mentioned in the beginning, to be able to be, be with them, if you could touch on it. So really, it's exactly what we've been talking about. You know, people like to think of, you know, puberty and sexuality and these straws like a separate struggle. Like I was, so we read it on Yom Kippur. Oh, I got to say that because we're, we're, this is this week's Parsha. I don't know when we're going to release this, but right now we're talking and it's going to be Parsha to Emma. So I have to mention this. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so the tart. Yeah. So we just, yeah. this is what somebody, one of the Rabbanim that I trained just, just showed this to me. So we say that we train the Rabbanim. So once a week I, I, I work for an organization called Simha, which is Sephardic Initiative for Mental Health Awareness. And I train Rabbanim to be more aware and sensitive and attuned to dealing with mental health struggles. Mm -hmm. So one of the Rabban in my group, because he knows that I, I collect a lot of sources on this, uh, showed me a source I, I hadn't seen. So we said in this week's Parsha that all the Kohanim have a list of people they cannot marry. But the Kohen Gadol has an added one. He cannot marry an Almana, a widow. He has to marry a Basua, somebody who was never with a man. So the Moshev is a Kenim, which brings us from the Baleatosva. So these are very early people that came right after Rashi. Right? This is not a modern day Kizik Shmus. So he says, why is the Kohen Gadol not allowed to marry a married woman? Or a woman was married for her, her husband passed away. So is, if, if it wasn't in print, we would not be allowed to say such a thing. He says, the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur says the name of Hashem only once a year, only in the Kodesh HaKadosh. The Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies. But what happens there? Anything that goes off, first of all, it's a deadly name. Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, use it famously to kill, right? The, that, the, the name of Hashem in that sense is deadly up to the point that many Kohanim Gedolim actually lost their lives there. And in history, they started to put a rope around their ankles because nobody could go back in to get the body. So you'd have to be able to pull them out by a rope. So that's how serious the day was. But he said the reason the Kohen Gadol can't marry a married woman is because he's going to say the Shem HaMaforish Hashem's name and that has deadly power. And maybe he's going to think that he'd rather her husband be dead while he's doing the service. And that he'll kill her husband so he can marry her. The Kohen Gadol. The Kohen Gadol. <laughs> on the holy, in the holiest place, on the holiest holy day, day of the year. We, the Torah has to say, we, we have to allow it and he can't marry her. So that we shouldn't have a death on our hands. So we think, oh, I'm such a sick, perverted person. Or today's generation is so weak. That Balei is saying, this is what the Torah is conveying. That means the Kohen God also knew that. That deep in our subconscious, there's a dark and dark part of us that lusts and wants to murder and kill and rape and steal and do everything. And there's also this infinite glory that only wants kindness and love and connection. And they're both there. So the book is really just an outgrowth of that. To try to put the whole sense of all the things that we felt we couldn't talk about, which all the kids were struggling, and we keep screaming all day, the internet and technology, this, and what do we do for the kids? I'll, I'll, I'll tag your phone, and uh, I'll see you at the chuppah. Have a nice day. So the whole book is to bring the basic idea of premise of struggle, and the sexuality is just one part of Torah. It's always been there. It's been one, after Avodah Zohar was the biggest struggle for the Jewish people. Help them normalize it. Help them learn these messages about struggle. Help them learn how to cope. And maybe most importantly, that their adults, the parents and their educators should show up and say, I'm with you in this struggle. Because when they have to find out in the shadows, it's not so much that they're going to get the information somewhere else. Okay, you can get accurate information. But when you get it from a hidden source from your friend on the playground, as was shown from the internet, you also feel something's dirty, something's wrong. I'm messed up. Maybe I'm crazy. When your parent tells it to you, this is part of the show that Hashem made you. This is what's going to happen. It's a beautiful thing, really. This energy is for the loftiest of lofty. You're most like Hashem because you could create a life with this. But that also means it's going to have the darkest of the dark. Separation, disconnection, fake relationships, all of that stuff. Just selfishness, just self-pleasure. So the more we can be able to show up for our kids, be there, and say in your hardest times, and the most difficult thing, the thing that's very uncomfortable for me to talk about, I'm here with you. That, I think, is the most important thing. And that's really the whole impetus for the book as both messages of how do you talk to kids, what points to give them, but more importantly, really the back half is how do we deal with the struggles, particularly in this area, but really it's global messaging like about struggle. Bad today. Yeah. So uh, 
everyone can get it from any bookstores. So, uh, yeah. so some places it might not be on display in the more Haredi bookstores. You have to ask for it. It's uh, been in almost all farm stores on Amazon. And we do have a, you know, a special sponsor for Rabban and Mechan Kamer Mostos who want it for Rabbeim or, or educators that we have sponsored books free. I don't know if you have a show notes. We can put a link. I'll send you. Okay, uh, we'll uh, include a link. So, Dr. Zimmerman, powerful, amazing to for all that you do. We've had Baruch Hashem many events uh, together with the doctor explaining these topics to the, to the crowd and it's been very successful. We're planning on the Amir Hashem. But uh, like I mentioned, one final message for our broad audience. So, we're in the middle of, of Sphere, right? And I, I don't know when this is going to air, probably right I'm around Lagbaum. Lag so, if, if we just think for a moment, again, we think about Rabbi Kiva and we think, wow, Rabbi Kiva, the holiest of holy. Right, I'm not much of a historian, but if we even think for a moment about Rabbi Kiva's life, <laughs> the right. the, 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 the he grew up 40. He, he grew up totally poverty stricken, a total Amara. He says I would bite a Thomas Hoffman like a donkey, not like our dog, like a donkey. I would break his bones. Right, he's working for an extremely wealthy guy for peanuts. Right, he's right. He finally the the, the the rich guy's daughter takes an interest in him. So okay, he's finally a stroke of luck. Baruch Hashem, she, she says, I'll marry. What happens? His father-in-law says, if you marry this guy, you don't get a penny. They wake up. Finally, the best thing happened to him, they wake up penniless. And the Gemara tells us that he would wake up. They didn't even have a, a mat to sleep on. They were sleeping on straw. So he would spend the morning pulling out straw from his wife's hair. He had a previous marriage with a kid. So he brought that kid into this marriage. The kid didn't know anything. He didn't know anything. So he was sharing the same sort of, I don't know what they had in those days, some sort of like chalkboard where they were both learning Aleph based together. Right, so one message the Balei Musa give us. Then what does he see? He sees the water piercing a hole in the rock, and he says, "If the water, which is soft, can pierce a rock, so too the Torah, which is hard, can pierce my heart." The Balei Musa point out. Let's say you took all the water together that eventually went on the rock. You had this biggest bucket or dropped from one of these helicopters, and you poured it all on the rock. What would happen to the rock? Nothing. So we wait for these grand moments of inspiration. Wow, I heard this amazing message earlier. What is the real thing? Drops of water. Consistent. Only this consistent, small doses consistent. Wow. But then if we keep going, so you think finally, okay, so he then he grows, he outgrows Evi and his Rabbeim. They called him Talmud Chavar. Moshe Rabbeinu was Makana the Torah he learned. He was jealous of what he saw him do. He has 24,000 Talmidah. In for balance. Every single one of those 24,000 dies. Over 700 a day. Like, think about COVID times, who knows how it, right? The biggest yeshiva of all time and every single one. So besides for the devastation and destruction, what would you say? I became, I learned only at 40. I got this. What's Hashem's message to me? You would say, I'm out. I'm and out. Once, I get, also, what would be likely to say, how terrible a rabbi am I if none of my students have any respect for one another? They all were worthy of dying. Yeah, you would say, I should probably pass the torch somewhere else. I should call it quits. I should end just end the depression, go into a cave and cry my heart out. I'm out. Okay. That's not what Rabbi Kiva does. Rabbi Kiva picks himself up with five students. And he rebuilds Torah from them. So we also, a lot of times we think it's going to come from that huge deal, from that Siyah Mesechda, from this grand thing I do. The 24,000 is not where we have Torah from. It's from the five. He put his Paskama behind Bar Kokhva. He called him Mashiach. Terrible destruction. Terrible failing. Went south. Jews were killed. He witnessed the destruction. He's the Tana ultimately that when his friends are crying, when they see the foxes over the Beis Mikdash, they're like, this is a terrible destruction. He's laughing. But he says, because if that part of the prophecy came forth that there are going to be foxes crawling over where the Holy of Holies is supposed to be, then the, the rest of the prophecy that one day... We're going to have Mashiach is also going to come true. So here's a man that teaches us about struggle and his wife also. The, imagine the struggle. She banks on him. They all die. 24 years, so. years separation. 24,000 students die. Cut off from her father. Bringing in kids from other relationships. These two people epitomize struggle, failure, being broken down, being beaten down. Getting seemingly message from Hashem, you're discarded. I don't want this. Saying, no, no, somewhere in there I know that you got to do something. Keep going. Keep fighting. Find those places. 
And each person, we don't have 24,000 students or five, but each of us has a place. And maybe our grand vision went to pieces. Maybe that illusion we had, I'm going to be this big tzaddik or tzaddik, or I'm going to make the X amount of money, or I'm going to do this for Klai Yisrael. Most of the real work is in the small things. But the constant message is don't give up. And even when you see the destruction, that means eventually we're going to have Mashiach Tzakenu B'mher Amenu. May he come speedily in our days. We should all just bring the gula together. Wow, Dr. Stoyme Zimmerman, what a powerful final message. What a what inspiration. We appreciate everything they do for the of the Jewish people. And we want to remind everyone every single Tuesday night, uh, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Chazak Torah Talks with special guest Baruch Hashem, episode number 101. Uh, can I know Baruch Hashem? And uh, we want to thank all of the platforms that are hosting these podcasts. A shout out to Torah Anytime. Shout out to Daily Giving a Dollar Day. It goes a very, very far away into the entire Chazak team and staff over here. Right now is the prime time to place kids from public schools to Yeshiva before the September school year. Make sure to reach out to Chazak. Baruch Hashem, over 1,500 kids so far. Many, many more. Bezat Hashem. <clears throat> We're going full force with that. Uh, no child left behind. Every single Jewish child deserves every Jewish education. Suggestions for future guests on Torah Talks are welcome. Info at chazak, C-H-A-Z-A-Q dot O-R-G. And dedications are welcome as well. Yishakach, Dr. Zimmerman, and Yadra Torah, and Besarat Tavak. Amen. Ah, wow, what a Torah talk.